Ellen. All right. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual field trip of Ikeley. And uh, if you look at uh, our post for today, our assignment will be a quick reflection of uh, what you will be learning today. I also have a uh, very short slideshow for everyone to look at. So I'm going to uh, put it on right now, just uh, present it really fast so that you uh, get a little bit of a background of our um, guest for today. Okay, so uh, we have a virtual field trip and it'll be Ikeley and uh, everything is recorded. So um, uh, if I could uh, just make sure that everyone will be uh, muted at this time. And if you have any questions during uh, the course of our presentation today, uh, please uh, ask your questions in the chat box. Okay, so uh, why we're doing this is because uh, in Engineering Essentials, we have what we call as career connections. If you remember, while well, I'm, I'm teaching or we're teaching the class, I, we all always interject or we always put in some information about what type of discipline, discipline uh, this uh, topic is all about. Okay, so the objective of this virtual field trip is to help you connect to specific jobs, disciplines, professional roles, professional projects, or organizations that directly relate to the context of the activities, projects, and problems of this class. Today, uh, we are uh, grateful to have an organization, a business uh, local to us. They're found in Concord. They're called Ikeley, Ikeley Engineers. And uh, just uh, to give you a quick recap, Unit 2 deals with machines, mechanical advantage, mechanical design. And a big part of the designing is the use of mechanical designing, is the use of computer aided software. So hopefully we'll learn more about uh, those things uh, in today's uh, session. And then just a little bit background about my relationship with Ikeley. Uh, Ikeley is a is a company that I visited way back in, uh, I think it was 2017. So I was part of this teacher externship program. So uh, uh, I was invited to Ikeley for a week. And uh, what I did is I shadowed their engineers. I shadowed professionals in there. So I went uh, from, uh, like I went to work in a way at Ike 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. just going through uh watching what engineers do uh reading some of their manuals you know learning more about the company as you can see i have a picture of me in ikeley and they even took me to the sites that they uh that they work in so this is a picture in uh, the central valley uh we cannot take pictures of uh gallo winery and their projects there um it's not allowed, so I had a picture just outside of the vicinity. Okay, but while I was in Ikeley, I uh, sat with some of their designers because I was so interested with CAD then, and then they showed me, this is not their work, by the way, right here. Uh, I'm just showing you an example, but they showed me piping and how they would do pipes for oil companies, for the winery. And uh, on the left side, you'll actually see a picture of a... Uh, Dow Chemicals, who is known now as um, Corteva, and uh, the work that they do with Corteva. So they would show me like, here are the pipes that uh, we've done. And then they took me over to the site and they showed me that that's, that's the one that we exactly designed. And now it's up there. Okay, so uh, that's the thing that I've been talking to you guys about, about CAD computer-aided design, how you draw stuff first and you simulate. Uh, they showed me like uh, what happens if they uh, flood this or if they have uh, uh, chemicals going through this. Will these pipes hold that type of pressure of the fluids and all? They do some simulation before they even build it, okay? So uh, uh, today we are uh, lucky to have the executive vice president of Ikeley, Mr. John Sakamoto. Uh, so Mr. John Sakamoto joined Ikeley in 1992 and he oversees all engineering, procurement, construction management, 
ETCM operation. So uh, this is a little bit fuzzy for me as well. So hopefully Mr. Sakamoto will explain to us what he does in simple terms. Uh, he is highly experienced in regulatory affairs, manages complex projects from conceptual planning through startup. And uh, John graduated from the University of Southern California with a bachelor's in civil engineering. And he is a registered engineer in the state of California. And John is a part of our CCAP business advisory. Okay, so those students who are in the CCAP STEM program, like I told you, uh, I actually meet with a group of professionals uh, once a month so that we could plan out what we teach. And one of the things that we planned out is to have uh, career panels that happened already one time, remember? Uh, now we're doing a virtual field trip of a company, Ikeley, and that's happening today. And also we've been doing girls only once a month as well. And you knew that last week, it was, uh, was it last week or two weeks ago? It was Ikeley Stern to host uh, that girls only mentoring program. And we have some females from uh, female engineers, professionals from Ikeley um, visit us. All right, I think that's it for my introduction. I am going to turn this over to Mr. John Sakamoto. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, can you guys see my screen here? Yep. Okay, um, uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, this is a great opportunity for myself just to reflect on when I was in high school, um, <laughs> ninth, tenth grade, no clue I was going to become an engineer. Huh? Um, maybe by my senior year, and I had to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, I I decided I like I like to solve problems. I like uh, I was pretty good at math and some science, but um, I really love problem solving. So um, I elected to go and uh, go and pursue engineering, and it's been my career ever since. Um, so we'll kind of go through a lot of material today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ikeley, what we do. I will take you through some what is engineering, and then I'll show you some real examples of what we actually do in the field, okay? So um, Ikeley, we have four offices. Um, our uh, major office is in Concord, California. You know, that's where uh, I work. Um, let me share a different screen with you. Um, and let me kind of take you to where we are. Um, so can everyone see that uh, map over here? Recognize it? Looks yeah. any, looks familiar? So that's where you would be if you weren't at home um, at, at the <laughs> Ignacio Valley. But right on the other side of town um, is where the Ikeley office is, huh? Uh, we are located right at the corner of Diamond and Willow Pass. Uh, you may be familiar with our office building, which is right here. Um, our, our, I work, uh, we work on the six and seven floors of this building. You might be familiar where we are. Um, you guys know where Hobby Lobby is, the guitar shop, uh, Tower Records. So we're right there, huh? Uh, we're right in your backyard, um, and um, we're excited to be here. We've been in this office uh, since about 1987, 1988 is when we moved in, into the office. So uh, a little bit about Ikeley, um, uh, uh, our office. Um, while we've been in our current office uh, since 19... Uh, in that 88 time frame, um, uh, we are a very mature company. Huh? Um, our company is the oldest and largest uh, engineering company in the United States. We're not the largest by the numbers, but we're the uh, long us running company. What does that mean? Uh, we were founded in 1875. Uh, that puts the company at over 140 years old. Um, it is still family owned, privately held by the Ikeley family um, uh, with a fifth generation uh, owner. 
So we've been in this same concrete location. And what I'm showing to you, what you can see in that video shot is pretty representative of what you'll see in an engineering company. Huh? Um, it's not, it's uh, not our office, but our office is con uh, configured very much like this. We have meeting rooms, office rooms, conference, breakout room, training, uh, along with lunch and uh, employee break rooms. Uh, we have roughly about 300 people in the company. Um, um, and those were pre-COVID numbers. Um, we have reduced some just because of the shutdown that the whole country has experienced. And, and we do a lot of what we call alliance programs. Alliance programs are where we actually partner with Cortiva. We partner um, uh, with the Valero Refinery or Genentech or Gallo Wineries. And these are very important. Uh, they have hands-on uh, access to us as engineers to help them solve their problems. We're the third the largest in the Bay Area. Um, and we have offices in California, uh, one, one up here in Concord, one in LA, and uh, two others, one up in Washington State and in Montana. Um, so what do we do? Um, we, you heard the term EPC or EPCM, Engineering Procurement Construction. Engineering actually designs what you have to do. Uh, what, what are you intending to do? What problem are you trying to solve? And we engineer it. Uh, then we, after you engineer it, you have to go and buy all the equipment, all the steel, all the electrical wiring, all the computers, you have to buy all of that. That's called the procurement phase. And then the last phase is construction. Huh? Someone has to construct it. And so that's what we do. So when I say EPC or engineering procurement construction, that's, uh, the, uh, that's what we do here at Eichley. So we have some very major sectors. Um, so uh, not all, all engineering companies usually specialize in, a, in particular fields. Uh, here in the Bay Area, we are very rich with uh, some very mature and exciting industries. Um, a big part of it is bi biopharmaceutical. We call it biopharm for short. Um, in biopharmaceutical, uh, this is what you would term as the drug companies, the drug companies that uh, make uh, pharmaceuticals and medicines and drugs that help mankind. Um, and the biggest example of that, everyone's hearing about it now, is um, uh, Operation Warp Speed to get to the vaccine to cure coronavirus. Um, not listed here, but one of our partners that we do work with is Gilead. And we're not working directly on Operation Warp Speed. We're uh, operating on infrastructure items that uh, helps Operation Warp Speed go. We work in the food and beverage sector. As Joseph said, he went to visit Gallo. Um, Gallo Constellation Brands, uh, these are people that um, uh, make wines and different types of um, uh, liqueurs. Uh, we've worked at uh, places like Blue Diamond Almonds huh, up in Sacramento, the biggest almond uh, grower in the United States, but that's part of our some of our food and beverage line. We also work in petrochemical work. So we have uh, five refineries here in the Bay Area. This is what keeps your houses warm, your, um, your cars going, airplanes flying. It is energy uh, in the energy sector to make certain that uh, we can derive the benefit of engineering in uh, everyday life. Uh, uh, we also work in the mining sector. Um, in the mining sector, this is usually the extraction of minerals to make things like steels and plastics and things that you have and consider every day. But when you go get back into how is that, how is that uh, piece of metal made? Well, it's usually extracted from the ground, refined to a process, and then forged and uh, finished into whatever that final product would be. Huh? So. What is engineering? Huh? So 
Um, if you look in the dictionary, it says it's the application of science and math to solve problems. Uh, what I like to say is that's what we do. Uh, engineers solve problems. What is the problem? Is the problem um, uh, coronavirus and we have to figure out a vaccine? Is the problem, hey, it is uh, 45 degrees outside and you don't want to, it to be 45 degrees inside your house. So the problem is how do you heat a house? Uh, um, the problem may be I can't see at the night if I didn't have any light. So is what type of lighting solutions can I have within that house to make it comfortable? So everything that makes you comfortable, everything which you consider um, home, and there is nothing that you can really point to that didn't have engineering involved. Huh? And it does not have to be gala wines. It does not have to be a big oil refinery. But as you look at anything, I challenge anyone to look around the room that they're in right now and tell me um, what it is. And I'll tell you uh, why that was engineered. Huh? So here's just a room. huh? Uh, nothing fancy about this room. Uh, uh, it might be used as a den. There might be some uh, toys over there, a place to sit down, blankets. Um, and if I say anything from uh, the simplest of toys huh, and how it was engineered, uh, there is a lot of engineering that goes in there. Um, I can take this little house here and um, to construct that, someone figured out uh, what materials I needed, how to cut it, how do I put it together? Do I glue it? Do I nail it? Uh, what trims do I need? I need to paint that house. Paints are engineered products. Uh, how do I get the color yellow out? How do I, how much, how much of an application do I need? How do I need to prepare that surface so the paint doesn't fall off or chip off after I put it on? And how is it safe for kids? There's a ton of engineering in something as simple as that house. The glass that you look in outside, the transparency that you can see, uh, does it conduct heat? A lot of, we live in, here in California, some of the most stringent rules on uh, size of glass area so that we don't lose all the heat in our homes through that glass. As you know, if it's cold outside, you put your hand on it, it's very cold versus if you put your hand on that wall, which is warmer. Uh, so we engineer the glass to limit the amount of heat that escapes uh, outside of your house uh, in order to save energy around the room. Um, the sofa and how they got to these angles, how do you actually build that in a factory? Uh, the building uh, of a sofa, what type of material, what type of materials will take um, uh, the bounce that you have when you get into a sofa? Many times they have specialized machines that put it through as if you sat up and down in that seat a hundred thousand times, but they, but they do that simulation in a week to make certain those cushions hold up. So there, everything you look at in the room that's surrounding you right now has been engineered to some extent, no matter how simple you think it is, uh, when you get into the details, it's very, very complex. Huh? Uh, so when I look around the room, what's the most favorite thing I see? Uh, out of the corner of my eye right here, I see, what is this? Anyone recognize it? It's a goldfish uh, uh, package, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I'm certain a lot of yours. Huh? So when we look at um, goldfish, uh, Here's that little package that we just saw, huh? And you can see all the various packaging that goldfish comes in. Once again, without even focusing on the goldfish themselves, that package, uh, as you guys may, may or may not know, you know, one of the things they have to do is uh, they have to think of that. Uh, goldfish is actually very crumbly, huh? If it got squashed, how do you keep it from getting squashed? So they have a design that has this goldfish package that maintains that square shape. Huh? If you remember by opening a package, it's kind of a metal foil inside. 
to uh, make certain that the goldfish stays fresh and does not allow air to get in there. So when you open up that package, um, it is uh, very crunchy versus soggy. Um, um, even down to the adhesive that is on that strip, what is the right type of adhesive that has the proper fixing power? We wanna make it so people can, it, it's not easily open. So when they handle it and put it on the shelves and you take it home, the package is not open. That they wanna make it strong enough for that, but they don't wanna make it so tough that you can't just open that package yourself without uh, pulling out a scissors. They made it so you can roll that uh, package back down to try and keep it fresh. A lot of engineering that goes in there down to the color, color selection, uh, making certain that everything in that package is non-toxic huh? uh, to anything that you do. So let's watch this uh, video uh, for just a sec. In 62, crunchy little fish crackers swam into the hearts of kids and adults alike. 40 years later, I'm lapping up goldfish with a vengeance. What's the secret to creating this thin munchie? Well, it all starts with combining the ingredients in large mixing machines. After it leavens, the dough is dumped down a long chute to a laminator machine, which flattens it. Then in sheets, it travels by conveyor belt to a large roller called a die. This is the moment of truth. The most amazing, surprising, interesting thing about making goldfish is when the dyes roll across the dough. Over 50 goldfish are made in just a fraction of a second. So as you look at it coming across the line, there's just thousands of goldfish in front of your face. What a reproductive species. The fish are then salted, baked, and packaged. At least you know you won't find any. Hey, so uh, could everyone hear that okay as I played through that? Good. Uh, so uh, in engineering, uh, what we're seeing is that um, there is a lot of work in here. Even if I took this goldfish um, video that we just saw and take a look at some of this equipment that was done, all that equipment is engineered. Um, and I would surmise to say there are several million dollars in this process and the machinery uh, that makes goldfish. And so, and a lot of times people will say, wow, you're an engineer and people think of very complex things, but when you really break it down, even the simplest thing such as a goldfish cracker has immense amounts of engineering behind it uh, to come up with the manufacturing pro uh, process, which is the problem. And maybe the problem is, how do I apply salt uh, and get a, the right amount of salt, the exact right amount of salt that makes goldfish goldfish? Uh, because I can tell you if they did not have that right amount of salt, you probably wouldn't like it. Huh? Um, but tons of engineering that goes into all of these processes. Okay, I I'm gonna take you uh, now and uh, show you some real life examples of what we can do uh, in engineering. So this um, is a plant that we were helping to design. Um, I actually, I can't tell you uh, what it is. Um, um, it's confidential to a client. But what I can show you quickly is briefly take you through the process. Um, let me turn this spotlight off for a sec. And you can see this is a large industrial building, but with the engineering tools, when we design these buildings, um, we can actually go in and we build these in what's called layers, huh? So I can blow away a layer. I just blow out the roof, the outside walls, and I can enter the building, huh? Um, so let me get my bearings here.
And when we designed these, this is a computer-aided system, actually put real people in so you can see what's happening in this industrial building. Uh, and we use as tools and in tools, we can then simulate where, what is the proper dimensions? Can people get to certain areas where um, it, it takes us through the building? We can, if we say that would not work because this particular column might get in the way, well, maybe we should redesign it so we don't have that column there. Huh? But in this way, um, we can uh, design the most optimum system and we not only design this way but we actually take these models and when we're finished we can give it to the operators the the people who actually work in here and say use these models and you can train yourself on what's in the system um, and in that way it it's a very good tool that shows uh, shows people what they can do and how they can operate uh, the facility. So let's take a different look at a model here. So I will show you um, um, I will uh, show a different model. So this is another job that we did. Um, so this one I can tell you about. Uh, it was at a refinery in Salt Lake City. Um, at the time, it was one of the highest polluters of, um, of, uh, in the, of, for air quality. So one of the things that we did is we put on what's called a wet gas scrubber. And what a wet gas scrubber is, is a piece of uh, machinery that goes in. And what it does is we use uh, counterflow, where the gases from the refinery go up through this large stack. And from that large stack, as the gases go up the stack, uh, water falls down in the uh, opposite direction. Gas must pass through that water. And in doing so, we remove a lot of the impurities that come off that stack. And what comes off the very top of the stack is steam, which is basically um, uh, uh, water. Uh, water droplets uh, that come off. And next time you guys drive over the Benicia Bridge going north, like towards Sacramento, uh, you'll see the Valero refinery on the left-hand side. And you'll see a stack operating there, which we also uh, designed and put in uh, about 10 years ago. And it's using the exact same technology. And what it's doing is it, um, the Valero refinery at the time was uh, one of the dirtiest refineries in emissions. And since then, it's now one of the cleanest in the nation. Uh, so that's uh, what we do for environmental type of projects. So let, let's take a look at some of this. I mean, in the very same way, like that last model, um, I can go in here and take a look at the equipment. I can take a look at how we design it and the access ways that we can use uh, to, um, and the access ways that the operator would see. This is one where he would be walking down the stairs and maybe once he got down on the stairs, he would take a look and he needs to get to this manifold and maybe turn a valve here, various areas. But, with this computer-aided design, it gives us a very good visualization of what we're trying to do. I'm going to show you a couple movies now um, of what, uh, what we did and why we did it. The fuels that move Utah's economy. That's what we produce at our Salt Lake City refinery. While making the fuel that keeps you going, we comply with environmental regulations, and we're all about continuous improvement. So we're always looking for technologies that will help us produce your fuels more efficiently and with fewer emissions. Soon, we'll be adding one of these technologies to our refinery. 
Here's some background. In the air, there are tiny particles referred to as particulate matter 2.5 or PM 2.5. Their size is three times less than the diameter of a human hair. PM 2.5 can be directly released, referred to as primary emissions. There are three key sources of primary emissions in our airshed. PM 2.5s can also be formed as secondary emissions, meaning they result from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. These reactions start when precursor emissions combine with naturally occurring atmospheric elements. Precursor emissions include sulfur dioxide, SO2, nitrogen oxides, NOx, and volatile organic compounds, VOCs. VOCs are emitted from thousands of products, such as water heaters, lawnmowers, and solvents. In the presence of UV rays and water vapor, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds combine with the naturally occurring ammonia in our atmosphere. When they combine, ammonium nitrate is formed. That is PM 2.5. Our mountains create a unique environment here along the Wasatch Front. We have winter inversions when cold air is kept close to the ground by warmer air above it. Especially during these inversions, PM 2.5s can become trapped. What can be done about this? Well, at our refinery, we look for ways to put fewer nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide emissions into the atmosphere so that there are fewer necessary components to react with the natural ammonia in our air. To lessen these components, we're adding what's called a wet scrubber. A wet scrubber literally cleans the air from our refining processes before that air is emitted into the atmosphere. Scrubbing fluid removes nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide. Not all, but a significant amount. In fact, the primary emission of the scrubber is water vapor. You'll see a new, tall stack being built in our refinery. That's the wet scrubber. The cleaning will take place inside the scrubber. The white plume that you'll see coming out of the top of the stack will be the water vapor, cleaned of most emissions. Our refinery in Anacortes, Washington already has a wet scrubber. Here's what it looks like. If you have questions about the wet scrubber, please reach out. We're proud to explain this proven technology and how we're helping to clear the air here in Salt Lake City. The fuels that move. Okay, so as we back up, so the problem was uh, cleaning the air coming off this refinery. And so what we have and we what we installed was this wet gas scrubber in order to try and get that done. It was done and it was done successfully. Um, at the end of the day, you can see this model and you can see kind of um, a picture view of what we did with the model um, from the ground up. And this is what we ended up with. Um, everything that we put on paper uh, everything that we designed on the computer, um, we engineered it. Then we went and we had to buy. You can see a lot of equipment over here. That's the procurement process where we have to get all the structural steel, all the vessels, all the pipes, all the equipment, all the electrical power um, uh, components that are required to then build this project. And we went ahead and built it. It was a successful project after it was constructed and it's been operating ever since. It's been, this particular plant has been operating for about three years now. And the one at over in Valero has been operating since uh, 2010. So it's its 10th year anniversary and is the cleanest uh, refinery here in the Bay Area right now. Uh, something that you can all see while you drive by on uh, Highway 680. So let, let's take a look. So what happens in the very end when after we finished all the construction, let me show you uh, a short video here, hang on.
using a new tool. It's shaped like a tower. It's called the wet gas scrubber and a local air says it's the greatest thing to happen to Utah's air. This is the new tower you can see from I-15. And what comes out the top of that stack is is a, a greatly reduced um, stream of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides and uh, CO2. It's steam. It's harmless, even though it looks like smoke. This is according to the refinery's public affairs manager, Brad Schaefer. We want folks to know that 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 plume is water vapor, it's steam. Utah's largest refinery, Endeavor, formerly called Tesoro, has been building this tower. It's called the wet gas scrubber. What this piece of equipment does is uh, eliminates and reduces the amount of those precursors that we put into the uh, into the uh, atmosphere from our refining processes. Before the wet gas scrubber, emissions control systems here removed direct particle matter 2.5, the stuff that Utah Air Quality Group say is damaging to our health. The refinery also produces sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. They are precursors, which eventually turn into PM 2.5 particles. So the scrubber scrubs those out by filtering the gas through and spraying water that filters the bad stuff out. We're reducing those emissions with this wet gas scrubber by 95 percent. Breathe Utah's Ashley Miller says it's the best thing to happen to further reduce emissions. My literal initial reaction was woohoo! Miller says Utah's five refineries are a small part of the air pollution pie, but they work the hardest to reduce emissions. We really applaud their efforts. For the last five years, Endeavor has been producing emission control tools costing a total of $300 million. The wet gas scrubber is one of those tools. Live in the newsroom, Danica Fox 13 News, Utah. Okay, so um, it, that was a project that we did. Uh, we work on a lot of environmental projects. Um, with uh, mankind, we do a lot of technological advancements, but with them comes a lot of issues and problems. Huh? It might be plastics in the ocean. It could be air pollution. Um, it could be unintended consequences from mining and other industries. And we work hard to balance environmental effects with um, what you're trying to produce or manufacture. Um, in this case, uh, um, we do need energy sources to heat your homes, to drive your cars, uh, to power your vehicles, um, to move and transport across the country. And with that, we're trying to, in a very socially responsible way, uh, protect the environment and work on environmental projects. And that's on a grand scale. Uh, uh, on a smaller scale, which is not all that small, like goldfish crackers, uh, um, in something we don't even hardly think about, but uh, it requires a lot of problem solving and a lot of engineering. Huh? And there's room in the industries for many different types of skills. Uh, because we're an engineering company, does that mean that you have to be uh, able to crunch uh, hard numbers and calculations uh, for some of our hardcore engineers? That's correct. Uh, but we also need designers, people that are good on the computer, people that can design and take uh, some of the ideas and put it in a computer so we can then visualize it, see it, uh, turn it into documents that I can give to a construction firm to um, actually go out and buy the equipment or go out and build the equipment. So uh, there's a lot of facets. Uh, we have accounting, human resources. Um, we are always looking and one of the reasons we are really excited, I've been doing this for over 20 years with the Mount Diablo School District. Uh, we feel we need to give back uh, to the community. We feel that, hey, it is great if we can have uh, kids in our region wanting uh, to uh, strive to be engineers or designers uh, or uh, working in the assets that engineering has. It could be in construction. It could be in document control. Um, there are a lot of different um, uh, career and career types that engineering companies use 
uh, in order to uh, uh, build the uh, to build the projects that we do. So that about wraps it up um, on just a general introduction uh, for what we do over at Eichle Engineers. Uh, I look forward that uh, you guys will uh, continue journey um, in these classes uh, uh, with engineering, math, science, um, problem solving. Um, and I wish you guys the best. And I hope that, you know, maybe in um, four, eight years from now, uh, you come out of college, you're looking for a job, you may want to consider Ikeley right here in your own backyard. Yeah, go. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mr. Sakamoto. So I left I have a few yeah. minutes for questions hey. or things I can get uh, more in. Um, Oh, here we go. Answer for you. Yep. Uh, we have one question here from uh, Sarah Venegas uh, about how tall is that tower? Uh, that, that tower um, was about 102 feet tall. Um, and when you get into some of the details, so even the tower, um, it is located about six miles from the Salt Lake International Airport. Um, oh. And once you hit a certain height or you're in the flight path of an aircraft, uh, you're required to put uh, aircraft uh, lights on the top of the tower so that low flying aircraft um, uh, could not uh, yeah. hit the tower. <laughs> so, yeah, anytime you get into the details, it's very complicated and getting permitting and licensing for it. Uh -huh. uh, just a follow-up question on that, uh, Mr. Sakamoto. Did you build that tower somewhere else and then ship it over there, or did you uh, put the tower in that place? Uh, the, to the tower was actually, um, it's made out of steel plates, and when you weld the steel plates together, um, it then creates the shell uh, for mm. uh, the tower. So... Um, in this tower um, there, you can just see these seam lines in the tower and those are steel plates. And we have to scaffold all the way up the tower, a hundred wow. feet in the air and have men that actually welded. We use automatic welding machines uh, to weld all. But um, we did that job without uh, uh, someone getting hurt. Our main thing in construction is Everybody stay safe. Awesome, thank you. And we have uh, some additional questions here. Here's a really great one from David. How much chemistry you should know or study to work at Eichle? Um, uh, chemistry is not, a, so we have a lot of different engineers. Huh? Um, our engineers, we have what we call process engineers. And our process engineers deal with that chemistry. That video you saw used some complex terms, nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxides. And our process engineers dig deep into the chemistry itself. But when, um, but when I take a look at what we actually build again, um, uh, what happens inside with the water falling and the gas going up, I have my process engineers doing that. In order to build the vessel, I have mechanical engineers that deal with plates and welding. Um, all the structures that are here are done by civ uh, civil and structural engineers. And all the wiring that happens are by electrical. So very <laughs> nice to have. And you probably require it as a basic uh, requirement um, to get a overall engineering degree, but it's not required if you're not a process engineer at my company. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's a question from uh, Sarah Richnovsky. She's, uh, her question is what program, what software do you guys use to design? Um, we use a whole bevy of um, uh, products in order to uh, design what we do. Uh, um, to design the vessel. We have special uh, vessel programs uh, called PV Elite. There's exchangers. We use a separate program for that. 
to actually design what you saw on the screen. Um, we use AutoCAD, uh, which is uh, pretty much uh, dominates the market. AutoCAD designers are people that we hire. We've hired people that have graduated from DVC and through a technical program to become um, CAD designers. Um, but uh, we have electrical design tools, structural design tools. I would venture that we probably have a million dollars worth of software uh, in order to uh, design these plans. Uh, just a follow up question there, John. Uh, is it possible for a high school students to be hired as a designer or do they need to get some uh, college units for that? Um, so at ICLE, uh, the majority of all the people have college degrees. Um, uh, many of our designers do not have uh, uh, college degrees, but hmm. and we have hired people that have uh, gone through um, DVC and uh, technical college to learn the basics of uh, getting on the software and much of the development of how you design in the software um, then comes uh, with on the job training. Okay. Even our design order to you see um, uh, does, does need a solid foundation in basic math uh, and nothing really fancy like calculus, but they, they need to know dimensions. They need to know they have adding, subtracting. They have to know uh, basic trigonometry to figure out the angles on the triangle because everything is dimensionalized, you know, naturally in our society. And you look at a lot of things, they think square, round, triangular, and you need to know the basic functions to, uh, in math uh, to apply that in a design. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Jesus wants to know if you consider your job fun. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, when you are in the middle of, of it, it, it is like being in a NASA center. I mean, there are uh, a million details to take care of. Uh, the particular plant I showed you, the one that went in in, in Salt Lake was about a $100 million plant. Um, it uh, probably had a total of, my guess, uh, probably a hundred engineers and the, and to build it, probably three to four hundred construction workers. Our job, we usually see it all the way through construct. Um, uh, we've worked on much bigger jobs, up to one and a half billion dollars. Um, when when you're in the midst of it. Um, it does not seem all that fun, but when you look back, that's what I enjoy doing. Nice. Any other questions? Hey, John, I have a question, John. Yeah. This is Roll. Yeah, listen, uh, in the Salt Lake City plant, because there is going to be a shutdown for that part of the plant, is there what are the contingencies the uh, plant operators or plant owners do? Uh, there's a lot. Uh, shutdowns are of, uh, is a time of high um, of uh, high awareness uh, because what happens is we're tying into existing refinery systems which are filled with gases, combustible fluids, and you have to be ultra aware of all the piping and the piping systems to be able to drain them and drain them completely. You know, even the smallest amount of vapor or the gasoline in a pipe is flammable. <clears throat> And so in order to make the tie-ins and weld old pipes to new pipes, uh, you have to make certain it's, um, it's flush um, and run, uh, safe for entry. And they are numerous, just numerous protocol. I can, I can make the tie-ins. Any intern, in, internships in summers or programs at ICLE? Uh, at ICLE, we typically take a look at college students usually between their junior and senior year. Um, we do have programs where we go out and we interview uh, at the various campuses. <clears throat> uh, one of the campuses we interview at is uh, UC Davis. And we oh, usually, yeah. we uh, UC Davis and SLO, uh, San Luis Obispo. Mm -hmm. 
couple of our favorites. Uh, we don't uh, we do some amount of hiring from Berkeley and Stanford, but we want down to earth engineers that know how to solve problems. I don't need them to teach pharmaceuticals. I need them to build a facility that makes pharmaceuticals. Huh? I gotcha. I gotcha. You don't need esoterical people, you need practical people. Yeah, I don't need C guys. I need guys that really to roll up their arms and uh, roll up their sleeves and say, hey, we're going to solve this problem. How do we do it? And I got it. It's a lot of coordination between the various different types of engineers. You can see how congested those plants are, and they're packed with mechanical, structural, piping, electrical gear that all has to go through the same area and volume of space. So. I got Okay, thank you. So, John, can you please uh, mention those universities again for our uh, for our kids to hear? Uh, sure. Um, our uh, our favorite colleges uh, are UC Davis and um, and San Luis Obispo, uh, both part of the UC system. Uh, we have taken some people out of. DVC and designer roles, but usually when they have come out of technical college and have uh, some amount of years of experience. I mean, there are other colleges we have interviewed with outside of the area, but um, if we can find people that know and love California, um, uh, that's one of the reasons why we interview with uh, some of the local and California colleges. So there you go, guys. Okay. There you go. Those places are very hands-on, and uh, if you want to uh, do this kind of a job, you need to know how to really do it, okay? Not not just uh, theoretical, but you need to get your hands dirty. And all of our engineers, uh, because we move into construction, many of our engineers uh, do spend a lot of time. I've spent years in the field. Um, we built a one and a half billion dollar mining job in the, um, in the Mojave Desert, and I spent uh, about two years in the desert uh, uh, <laughs> through, through the 30 degree days and the 114 degree days, you know, <laughs> but uh, really satisfying to actually watch something being built that you actually designed on paper. There you go. And, and for the for the students listening, when you said that you recruit um, uh, engineers in the junior senior year, I'll have to attest to that because I got recruited at the same time at Cal State University Northridge. You know where that is, John? Yeah, okay. yeah, I know where that is. Big earthquake there at one point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just wanted to add that. Yeah, good. Um, any other questions? I hope you found this. Uh, uh, informative and uh, maybe exciting you to a uh, new field to take a look at. And uh, students, this is a great time for you guys to express your gratitude, either if you want to clap or if you want to type something in, even a direct message to Mr. Sakamoto. I think that would be really great. Thank you very much, uh, Roland, Joseph. Uh, Thank you, John. Uh, April did a great job in, in setting this up, uh, and I look forward to uh, talking to you guys again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Go Trojans. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.